to welcome you all to our Victoria Christian Reformed Church on this lovely Sunday morning where we have alternately liquid sunshine pouring down and beautiful rainbows. How many saw a rainbow on the way to church this morning? Oh, I guess you weren't far off early enough. <laughs> Some of you did. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'd like to welcome those who are watching online, and we'd like to welcome any visitors we might have with us today. And a special welcome to our visiting Pastor Yo, who comes to us to bring God's word all the way from Burnaby. Welcome, everyone. We invite you to stand as we begin to worship in song to our great and faithful God, whose love is new every morning.
Hello, hello. Uh, I just want to take a moment to introduce a family who's been worshiping, worshiping with us for quite some time, and we finally got their transfer papers and memberships all approved. So if you guys wouldn't mind signing up, uh, Jennifer and Mike Van Ness, welcome, welcome. Uh, they're originally from Willoughby CRC, um, and they also have their children here. We've got Jonathan. There we go, one in the middle. Uh, and I've been told he's dating Ashley, but she's not here right now. Uh, Nicole, who's married to Alex Banger, and she's not here. Uh, Luke, who's dating Meryl. That must be Meryl. Hi, Meryl. <laughs> and then Caitlin. And I guess you're still available. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, and then, of course, I'd like to introduce Pastor Yo from uh, Eng Elgin Street. Did I get that right? Elson Avenue, close, uh, from Burnaby. So come on up and give us a blessing. Thank you. Let's stand up together. I love that song. You know, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. I believe the welcome of Jesus is new every morning. No matter who you are, Jesus welcomes you here. Hear this, hear, hear this greeting. Grace and mercy and peace and love to you from God the Father. The Father who loves us from Jesus Christ who died and rose for us. And from the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and sanctifies us. And all God's people say. Amen. Let's take a few moments say hello to each other. Maybe pass the peace, the peace of Christ to you. So if you just take a few moments, say hello to each other. Good morning. How are you doing? Good to see you. to shine we're going to sing this little light of mine but we're going to introduce two new verses perhaps it's new to you actually it's not new to me <laughs> but um, in case it's something you're not familiar with we'll do it you know simply at first and you can feel free to join in whenever you can all right so this little light of mine traditional verse uh, choruses going into slightly different verses so heads up <laughs>
just before we sit down, we're going to say together the Apostles' Creed. So just stand up just for one more minute, one more minute if we can. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, uh, a creed that unites us with the church throughout the ages, but also the church around the world. Let's say these words with our mouths, but also with our hearts. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's have a seat. I want to lead you in a call to confession this morning. And so in our church tradition, so often when we gather, we praise God, we worship God, we also confess the wrongs of our lives, and we are reminded of the forgiveness we receive through Jesus Christ. And um, at least when I've heard most confessions of sin, it goes like this, you know, we, we confess our sins, we've done wrong, things we've said or thought or done, and after the confession, then we hear how great the forgiveness and grace of God is through Jesus Christ. This morning, I'm going to switch that around. Um, I don't think Christians should confess their sins, and I don't think we do, without knowing how great the grace of God is. Uh, if we did not know that grace, I don't think anybody would confess their sins to God. So I want to first of all, us hear the grace of God, and then in that grace, confess our sins. So here's some words of grace and God's goodness to us. Uh, the free pardon from 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to chapter 2, verse 2. And uh, let's hear these words, and after that I'm going to pray a prayer of confession. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you, God is light, in Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out, out, we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. There's the grace. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, here it comes again, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, and I know some people do that, they claim, I don't sin. Well, the Bible says, if we do that, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write, th I write this so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray a prayer of confession. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we come, and we're so thankful we can hear good news this morning. The good news of who you are, great is your faithfulness, O God. Your mercies are new this morning. Your welcome is new and fresh for us this morning. And we're also so thankful because even as we think about the wrongs we have done, we come with a sturdy word, the sturdy good news that we have an advocate with you, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He has atoned for our sins and also for the sins of the whole world. And so, Lord, us as a community, but also us individually, we confess, O oh God, that we have sinned, we have done wrong things. 
we have said wrong things, we have thought wrong things, and it goes on and on and on, Lord. We confess that to you. This morning, especially, we think about those that we sin against who are so close to us. A spouse, a child, a parent, a friend, a next-door neighbor, someone we have been in this church community with for maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years, Lord. And there are sins that we pass back and forth so often, the impact we have on each other as we sin. And we pray, Lord, that you would hear us this morning as we confess those sins, uh, even as we might think of them very specifically in our minds, the things that we have done wrong or said wrong or thought wrong. And then, Lord, even as we confess, again, we cling to the good news, Jesus Christ, the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of those around us and for the sins of the whole world. We thank you for that good news. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Jesus never forgives us just to forgive us. He always forgives us that we might live a certain kind of life. We might live out the forgiven life, the saved life. And so hear these words from Colossians chapter 3, words that are meant to Help us live out the Jesus life, the Jesus walk. Colossians 3, uh, 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Can you hear that this morning? Dearly loved people of God. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and rule in this community. Since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through Him. And hopefully all God's people say, Amen. Let's sing together.
right here. And if there's any more in the vicinity, we invite you to, after we pray for you, head downstairs for Sunday School Stories and Crafts. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you love our children as we do. No, actually, you love them much more. Please bless them today as they learn about you. Give them strong and healthy minds and bodies to serve you as they grow. Amen. prayer today <clears throat> but that's absolutely fine let's come to the Lord in prayer Father God you've heard our, our prayer of confession already and it's so wonderful to hear that you forgive us when we confess our sins and when we come to you repentance and forgiveness hand in hand and we have the assurance that you are with us. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord God. You are there regardless of what we have done, patiently waiting for us. You are the light in the darkness. Your word is a bright, clear beacon of truth and peace and justice. We praise you for all that you have given to us. And you have given us Jesus, our source of salvation. Shine, Jesus, shine with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Here in this place, in our hearts, we pray that your Spirit would reign in our relationships as well, in families, in marriages, friendships, in our business dealings, we pray, Lord God, that we would be forthright, honest, and true. Lord God, we choose to follow you into the light where the darkness cannot exist. Lead us, Lord God. Father, we think again of all the conflict in the world, and we pray against those who would prey on innocence. And we ask, Lord God, that you would turn their hearts away from evil, protect and defend the innocents. Lord, we think about those who are suffering with disease and illness, we think specifically of Mary. We ask that you give her full healing and comfort. We think of Reen and Rowley again, and Dave and Ellie Crowell. Lord God, I'm sure that there are other folks on our hearts, and Lord, we'll just take a moment that we might offer them up to you. Thank you, great healer. We ask that you be with all those who are suffering from aging, from dementia, from cancer, from addiction, anxiety, depression, mental illness of all sites. Come, come next to us and support us. Lord God, we pray for all the congregations in Victoria. We pray that you might strengthen them and lift them up. 
Reach your spirit out across this city and draw people to you, to your word, to your churches. Stir in their hearts that they might see that the hole that is in their hearts is not filled by pleasure or money or power, but it can only be filled by you. Thank you, Father. And Lord God, we ask that you give a blessing on today's gifts for our church's budget and for Arosha. We pray, Lord God, that these ministries will be blessed by these funds. And we ask, Lord God, that you Lay your hand on Pastor Yeo as he delivers this message today. Open our hearts and our minds to the wisdom that he is distilling into from the word of God. In the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
I've heard that music before. And I could be wrong, but I'm thinking the Mission soundtrack. Wow, that was like amazing. Uh, 1984-ish or 80s sometime. I forget when the movie came out, but uh, that just all of a sudden, wow. So thanks for that. That was great. Um, let's take out our Bibles if you have a Bible. We're going to turn this morning to the Gospel of John. Uh, there are a few Bibles here in the front row. There are Bibles uh, by the sound booth. And if you have a phone, I assume you have a Bible. You can access a Bible, and it's right here. But uh, it'll be here for a little while, and then as I start uh, going through the message and the, and, the, and the passage, if you want to have a Bible with you, I think it'd be really helpful. So uh, this is a pretty familiar, at least if you're in church on a regular basis, a uh, pretty familiar passage, I think. It's John 13, Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, and we're going to read that in a few moments. I do want to say I'm thankful I'm here this morning. Um, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of connection. I've been in this building before. I forget when. So I, I, it's been a while, but I'm thankful I'm here. Um, I do have some connection, David and Brittany Salverda. I, I would count them as friends of mine. I uh, haven't seen them for a while now, but uh, thankful for their ministry. And we stayed in their house a number of years ago. Our family did one summer. They were gone, so they invited pastors who wanted, who are in the Victoria area. So uh, we stayed in their house for a week. Uh, that was a number of summers ago with, with our kids. And um, I'm just realizing uh, the offering at the church I serve in Burnaby this morning is also for Arasha. So I'm feeling a little connection there. We're actually having a speaker from Arasha uh, speak to our church this morning about their ministry and about creation care. And then, I don't know how this is possible, but one person I met this morning during the greeting time knew that I was born in Welland, Ontario. I thought, how is that possible? So I, I just like, one of those moments, you think, how? Anyhow, so I'm, I'm feeling some connection, at least to some of you this morning. I'm, I'm thankful I'm here, and we're going to do something totally maybe unusual for Victoria Christian Reformed Church. We're going to read the Bible, of course. That's not unusual, but then after the Bible reading, I know some of you will love this and some of you will not so much, but um, we're gonna, I'm going to invite you for two minutes, either on your own or with some people around you. I'm going to read the Scripture, and then I'm going to ask you, what did you notice? What did you hear? What did you see? What was a verse or a, or a phrase or an image or something from the story that kind of grabbed your attention? So you can do it on your own, just kind of look at it again and think, okay, what did the Spirit bring to my attention? Or I'd really love for you to share that with two, three, four people around you. So it's just going to be a really quick two-minute sharing. That what did you see? What did you hear? What did you notice? What question do you have? What, what do you have what, what's, what's unusual that maybe you notice in this passage? So uh, John 13, 1 to 17. Uh, it was just before the Passover supper festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do, not realize what, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. 
When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. This is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks. Thanks be to God. Amen. So if you're willing to, and sort of even if you're not, uh, just for two minutes, either on your own, you can just look at the passage again and just wait for the two minutes to be done, or someone beside you, or around you, or in front of you, what did you notice? Is there something that caught your attention? Uh, If you're willing to share that with someone or someone's around you, two minutes starting now. Well, maybe not quite two minutes yet, but a sort of sense maybe conversation was dying down. Now, uh, one of the reasons I, I like to do that, and I know that not everybody in the church that I serve likes that when I do that, but what I like to do that is because I'm not the only one who has wisdom about this passage. I'm not the only one who might have some reflection or some insights. So my conviction strongly is that all God's people have the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God. So just a couple of minutes, maybe sharing something that the Spirit was moving in your heart as you read the passage with someone beside you or behind you, whatever it is, I think it would be really healthy for a church community. I want to begin this morning with a quote from uh, Dwight Moody, who was a Christian evangelist, I think 19th century. And I'm not sure what you'll think about this quote. I'm going to say I like this quote. That's why I'm going to share it with you. But Dwight Moody said that the Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. Now, I don't think Dwight Moody was saying there's no information in the Bible. Of course there is. Lots of information. But I think he was saying don't have that experience, maybe Sunday mornings. Like this is one of our problems, I think, with the church sometimes and with pastors. But also my experience of catechism class when I was younger and Sunday school and children's church and lots of moments where I've been kind of uh, listening to someone talk, it just felt like information. Like someone's trying to tell me something that I need to learn and remember, the facts, the trivia, know this, maybe memorize this, but it wasn't always articulated that the information is there for a reason. Not just so that when there is a question asked, like how many disciples did Jesus have, or how many books are there there in the Bible, etc., etc., you might know the answer, but the answers are the, the information is given, the stories are given, the facts are given, that there might be transformation in our lives. So I think Dwight Moody is right. 
lots of information, lots of facts, lots of trivia, lots of things we can talk about, but all that stuff in the Bible, in this morning's passage as well, is there that God might do something in us, might change and transform our hearts, our lives, our relationships, and this is always God's, God's intention with His Word. He never speaks His Word and nothing happens. That's not God's intention. Just send the Word out, let there be light, and there was light. There was a change, kind of a transformation in the creation. So God, by His Word, wants to change and shape and mold and do something in our lives every time we hear the Word. It might be small things, but it's never there just to say, Oh, remember this name. Oh, remember this fact. Oh, remember what he or she said. Let something by the Spirit of God, as the Word of God is being read or reflected on, let it change you. And uh, this is why we never talk about the Word of God all by itself. I know sometimes we do, but we should never do that, especially in our tradition, the Reformed tradition. We have a great emphasis on the Word and the, the Spirit. It's never the Word all by itself. It's never the Spirit all by Himself. Right? It's always the Word and the Spirit coming together in the preaching, in the reading, in the study, in the meditation. And just one verse uh, outside our passage this morning that, that I was thinking about recently is from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3. Now, I don't know how much you read the book of Revelation. I have some people in my church who read it, I think, too much. That's their book especially certain verses. That's all they think about. Others of us maybe don't read the book of Revelation enough. But uh, Revelation 1 verse 3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. So there's blessing in the reading. And then the verse says, And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. I read that verse and I think, blessing in the reading, but also blessing in the hearing and taking to heart. Something's happening on the inside as we hear it and reflect on it. And this is the goal this morning as well, transformation, not just this morning certainly, but in the story itself. Jesus says explicitly, do as I have done for you. And this morning as well, the story is meant to get inside of us. In whatever way the Spirit leads you, do as Christ has done for you. So I want to just spend some time this morning thinking about the question that Jesus asks in verse, three, in verse 12. Uh, John 13, 12, where Jesus says, Do you understand what I have done for you? Now why is Jesus asking this question? I think, I think he's asking this question because the people he's asking typically don't understand what he's doing. Now, on the one hand, this should baffle us. These 12 disciples, and there were others who were following Jesus, they saw the signs, the miracles, the healings, they heard the teachings, they even sometimes got private interpretation of the teachings. We don't know what you said there. Please tell us, and Jesus told them. But even though they hear it, they see it, they typically don't understand what Jesus is doing or saying. And I said, on the one hand, it should baffle us. On the other hand, that's just like us. That's just like us. It's just like me. So these disciples are not typically the ones who are asking Jesus, what can I do? How can I help? How can I serve like you do, Jesus? They're asking questions like this from the Gospel of Matthew 18, verse 1. Uh, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest 
in the kingdom of heaven? That's their big question. Not how can I serve in the kingdom? How can I follow your example in the kingdom? No, no, no. Who's the greatest in the kingdom and why are they asking that? I hope it's me. I hope I'm the greatest in the kingdom because it can't be him over there and it can't be her over here and most of those people. No, no. It must be me. I want to know, and if it's not me, how could I become the greatest in the kingdom? This is their big question, not just once, but multiple times in the ministry. We read about this in the Gospels. So they don't get what Jesus is doing or teaching. Now, truth be told, this is our question as well, typically, isn't it? Who is the greatest? Who is number one? Who has the most toys? How much is Taylor Swift's net worth? My daughter, yesterday in the car, she said the word billion. That's a lot of net worth. Who has the most friends or followers? Who has the most power or the most influence? Who is the GOAT? The G-O-A-T, the greatest of all time. Basketball, hockey, singers, actors, cooking show hosts. Who is the greatest? It's our question as well. And these questions from the disciples, they just keep on coming. They, they say them in different ways. You know, they can ask, who's the greatest? Or they can also say it like this. For Mark 10, 37... This is James and John, the sons of Zebedee, coming to Jesus, and they say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask, Jesus. And Jesus very graciously says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, let one of us sit on your right and one of us on your left in your kingdom. Please, 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 Jesus, Give us those places. We know you're the goat. You're the one sitting on the throne, but we want to be there right beside you. Give us those positions. Maybe the minister of finance or the minister of infrastructure or the minister of the military, the army, but give us those positions. Now, anybody heard about the TV series called the Chosen? Ah, I don't know if you're fans. I'm, I'm, I'm just a huge fan. So this is a TV series. I'm not sure you heard about this, and I'm not getting any royalties from telling you about it, but uh, this is a TV series. You get a free app. You can watch it for free. A TV series about the life of Jesus, which if someone had told me they're making a TV series about the life of Jesus, I would have said, it's probably not going to be very good. Like, pretty bad, bad acting, I'm not going to like it. I can't get enough. Now, that could be something about me. Like, I, I, watch, I like watching TV shows and movies. I'm kind of wired that way, so they, they got me. But I find this TV series so compelling. I commend it to you. Just even watch one... <laughs> feels like I'm doing a promo here, but just watch one episode and email me what you think. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Anyhow, it's for free, so I don't feel like I'm, I'm taking any money from you or they are. You can get the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the app and the episodes, but in this, in this chosen TV series, they have James and John ask Jesus this question. We want to sit on your right and on your left. And in the TV series, they, their, their thinking is, <laughs> they say, oh yeah, Jesus told us, ask and you will receive. That's their whole logic. Oh, we heard those words, Jesus, ask and re- you will receive. So we're going to ask you for these positions of power. Do you understand what Jesus has done in this passage? Jesus is washing 
dirty, stinky, filthy feet. Uh, hopefully you get that, but I don't think any of us do because none of us live in the first century. Right? Anybody got stinky, filthy, dirty feet this morning? Well, mine are probably not the freshest, but they're not like the first century, right? We have socks, we have shoes, we have sidewalks. But in the first century, the feet were stinky, filthy, and dirty, and that's why always the servants wash the feet. Always the lowest person in the social setting wash the feet. So when we think about Jesus washing feet, he's not washing our 21st century feet. Some of us would never even do that, but he's not washing our feet. He's washing feet that are dirty because of the roads and the dirt and other things on the roads, right? There's no socks, there's sandals, there's lots of walking going on. So the one who is the leader, the one who is the teacher, the one with all the power, takes this lowest position that nobody in the first century with power would ever do. The Lord is bending low. The teacher is the humble one. The king is the servant. And I think it's important for us sometimes to see if we can imagine what was it like to be in the first century. So I've been reading a book recently called The Air We Breathe. And it's a fascinating book. The, the author, his basic thesis is all the concepts we have in our culture, all the things in the cultural air like equality and freedom and kindness, all these things we take for granted in our Western culture are only possible because of the influence of Christianity in our culture. So in the first uh, century, as he thinks about the first century, he thinks about the first century's view of equality, which is so different than our culture's view of equality. Uh, in the first century, the idea that all people are created equal, that all people have rights or inherent dignity, was nowhere to be found. Men and women were not equal. Citizens and slaves were not equal. Adults and children were not equal. Children really did not have any status in that culture unless, of course, you're the firstborn son. But other children, especially girls, could be easily discarded, and we have testimony of if it's a girl, you can abandon that girl on the garbage dump. You know, we don't want another mouth to feed in our family if it's a girl. Wife, if it's a girl, just get rid of it. The only people who were equal in the first century in that Roman Empire were the free men. Maybe 10%, 15%, at the most 20% of the population. So the idea in our culture, Western culture, that all people matter, all people have rights, all people have dignity, that idea had not even stirred in the first century. And so when I think about that, I think the whole idea of leaders serving or servant leadership or what Jesus did in that upper room, washing the feet of his disciples, no leader in the first century would have done that. No leader would have humbled themselves like that. Leaders don't serve those who are following them. So I want to ask us again like Jesus did, do you understand what Jesus has done? And he's washing the feet of every disciple. Now, we, we already had that in the passage, right? He knew the one who was going to betray him, but he still she still washed the feet of the one doing the bidding of the evil one, right? The one who's following the evil one to betray his master. So he's washing the feet of Judas, but he's also washing the feet of Peter, who will a few hours later 
I don't, I don't know that guy. Are you sure? I don't know that guy. Are you sure? And then he even starts calling down curses on himself. I don't know that Jesus. So Jesus washing the feet of Judas, knowing what's going to happen, washing the feet of Peter, knowing what's going to happen, but then washing the feet of all the disciples because we're told that in the moment of his greatest need in the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples left him. So he's washing the feet of a group of people who've been with him for three years, but in the end, they all abandon him. Do we understand what Jesus has done? He's not washing the feet because he's feeling guilty. He's not washing feet for the sake of a photo op. He's not washing feet so people will notice him. He's not washing feet so that he can move up the social or spiritual ladder. He's not washing feet to earn brownie points or to get accolades or it's on my to-do list. You know, like some of us maybe have a spiritual to-do list. You know, I got to read my Bible. I got to pray. I got to go to church. I got to tick all these things off. There is no to-do list for Jesus. Why is he doing this? Or what's stirring him? And maybe some of us caught this, but I find the first three verses of chapter 13 so amazing. If you have a Bible, I'm going to read them again. You, you have to understand how John sets up the whole foot washing. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. So he knows what's happening. He knows what's coming. He's very aware. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So the love just continues. There's no interruption. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas. Jesus knows that the son of Simon is scared to betray Jesus. Jesus knew, and here we go. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power. He has all the power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he knows what's happening. He knows what's going to happen. He knows about Judas and Peter. He knows the Father has given all the power to him. And then the Bible says, so. So it's out of that, I know all things are going to happen. I have all the power. It's out of all of this understanding of the Father, what, what the Father has given him, it's out of all of that he goes and washes the feet. So it's not out of guilt. It's not out of, I have to. Jesus is washing feet because he knows who he is. And if we put you know, different verses from the Gospel of John together, we know the very first verse in the Gospel of John told us, in the beginning was the, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. So we can say, yes, Jesus is washing the feet of his disciples, and we can also say the Word was washing the disciples' feet, and we can also say God himself. God himself is washing these dirty, stinky feet. And this is who God is. If you have ears to hear, this is who God is, the God of the Bible, the God who kneels, the God who stoops low, the God who humbles himself, the God who serves his people. That's what God, with all the power, that's what he does. That's who he is. Do we understand what Jesus has done? That not just this moment, but his whole life was a service. Not just washing the feet. Every time he healed someone, he was serving someone. Every time he was teaching, he was serving. Every time he was praying, if you keep reading the Gospel of John, chapter 17, the longest prayer we have of Jesus was called the high priestly prayer. As he prays for others, he's serving them. Jesus hanging on a Roman cross, he's serving others by dying for the sins of the world. 
And do we understand what Jesus is doing also for us here today? So as he says in verse 15, John 13, 15, I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Which I don't think, I mean, you could, but I don't think it means wash each other's feet, literally. Because we're not, we don't have first century feet. I think there's something else going on. We actually have to try and find those things in our lives that nobody wants to do. That we would always expect somebody else to do. And when we can find that thing, whatever it might be, then we start understanding, oh, <laughs> this is how low Jesus went if he was in the 21st century. Right? He, he probably wouldn't be washing our feet because they don't need to really be washed. He'd be doing something else. And what's that thing in our lives or in your community that Christ would be doing? Do we understand that the Master has washed feet that we might follow in His example to humble, humble ourselves before each other as He has done? And this, you know, just goes through all of our relationships. Uh, so often I know when our children are younger, you know, Oftentimes, it's the parents serving the children. Now, my children are a little bit older, so it's not so much... I mean, we, I still kind of serve them once in a while, but I sometimes get them ready. I say, one day, I'm, I'm driving you to the bus or to the train. I'm helping you out because one day I know you're going to have to serve me. God, I won't be able to do it. This is what we do. At a certain age, the parents serve the children, and then hopefully one day <laughs> the children serve the parents because they can no longer do it. Uh, I would advocate very strongly that spouses are called to serve each other. That's the way a marriage works best. If it's just one of us in the marriage serving the other, that probably doesn't go along so long. It's not going to sustain the marriage. We need husband and wife serving each other. Those with power of any kind, influence, resources, serving those with less power, less influence, less resources. Leaders in a community. I mean, this is what you want to look for for leaders in any kind of community, but especially a church community, who will serve the people in the community. And especially when things are maybe difficult in a community, whatever the community is, a marriage, a family, a group of friends, a small group, a church, you really want to ask, Lord, we have to serve each other. That's the calling. Not what I want so much, but finding what others need, how others are needing to be served. And this just goes across all the lines of relationships. Not so much, I serve you, or you serve me, or we serve them, but as the Spirit is giving grace and opening up our eyes, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, serving each other because Jesus Christ has served us in so many ways. So do we understand what Jesus Christ has done for us? And I ask that question not so that you'll say, yes, we know the answer, but that for my life, in my relationships, but also for all of us, the Word might not just inform us, but it would transform us. It would shape us. We would feel our hearts worn, maybe even this morning, and we'd say, I hear the call. I hear it loudly or softly. I hear it afresh. I know, maybe even some of us know this morning, I know who I have to serve. I know what I have to do. The Spirit is leading. The Spirit and the Word coming together. The Spirit, the Spirit speaking to me. I know what I have to do this day or this week. I'm going to invite the worship team up. We're going to sing in a few moments. So worship team, if you'd come up, and then I'm going to pray. And out of that, we're going to sing.
And I'm going to ask you, if you're willing to, just think about someone, and so not lots of names, just one name, one person, one face. could be someone very close to you or someone who's not here today, whoever it is, I got a feeling some of us have a prompting this morning. We, we know who we have to serve or who we're called to serve. So I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to pray a name, but I'm going to ask that God, whatever name's come into your mind, whatever person, God would give all of us strength, strength to serve that person in whatever way we're being called to. Let's pray, then we'll sing. Oh, Lord Jesus, you have served us so well, and you continue to serve us, even through your word this morning. We're so thankful, and we're amazed by this story. It is almost more than we can bear. How low you came, how low you became, how humbled you were and are. And we pray, Lord, I pray for anyone this morning who has a prompting from the spirits. There's someone you're calling us to serve. We know what we have to do. We know who we have to serve. Give us grace. Give us strength. Give us your life, the life of Christ in us, that we might serve others as you have served us so well. So hear our prayers. And Lord, for those of us who maybe have no inkling Stir in our hearts, make our hearts soft toward you, and open up our lives, Lord, that we might serve as you've served us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
assume after the service, I, I did see a coffee pot out there. So I assume you have coffee afterwards and maybe tea and juice and maybe goodies or no, no goodies. Okay, well, something to drink at least. So please stay for that and stay for conversation. And as I give you the blessing and then we'll have our final song, uh, do know that you are dearly loved. That Christ calls you to serve because you are dearly loved. Not in order to become dearly loved. He served those who were his own, and he has served us, and he sends you with these words. Receive the blessing of God. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May Christ turn his face towards you, be gracious to you. And may Christ be present in your, life, in your lives in tangible ways and give all of you his peace and all God's people say. in our lives and go out and spread the joy. for it.